Hello and welcome back to Metal Machine Shop. This time I'm going to look at the steering mechanism and geometry for a tilting reverse trike motorcycle or velomobile. By reverse trike I mean one that has the two steered wheels at the front, sometimes referred to as a tadpole trike. This video would also apply to tilting four-wheeled vehicles. This is the third video in the series on my tilting reverse trike velomobile project. So it might be worth watching the first two videos before you watch this one, so that you understand some of the concepts I'm going to be discussing further in this video. In my first video I looked at the tilting mechanism, and in the second I looked at the overall velomobile design. I'm going to upload the videos on steering geometry in two parts. This part will look at some of the underlying principles, and in the next part to be uploaded in about a week's time, I'll show you some CAD models where I can explain in further detail some of the implications of the various factors that you can change in the steering geometry. Getting the steering geometry right for a tilting trike is not straightforward as the correct angle and alignment of the two steered wheels needs to be maintained at all lean angles. If we get this wrong the leaning will affect the steering leading to poor handling and rapid tyre wear. I'm going to look at Ackerman steering geometry to see how this applies to the tilting trike case. Firstly, I'm going to check to see if Ackerman steering actually does work, and then I'll look at the changes we have to make to get from the ideal Ackerman geometry to the real world case. I'll take you through the steering mechanism options I've come up with for my Velomobile, and the adjustments and compromises that can be made to tune the mechanism and get as close to the perfect geometry as we can. Ackerman steering. You've probably heard of Ackerman steering. What Ackerman says is that the inner steered wheel has to pivot through a greater angle than the outer wheel to avoid tyre scrub. So the inner wheel has a smaller turn radius relative to the outer wheel, and the inner wheel has to steer through a greater angle than the outer wheel has to. So the inner steering angle is greater than the outer steering angle. Ackerman geometry says that the steering arms must be aligned with a line drawn between the steering pivots and the centre of the vehicle's rear axle, or the centre of the rear wheel in the case of the trike. The ends of the steering arms are joined by a single linkage. I thought I'd start out by checking whether Ackerman geometry does actually work, so I've modelled an example in CAD to see what I can learn. And here it is. So what we have is the tie rod here, the steering arm, the steered wheels, left and right, uh, and these spikes along the side here align with where the wheel should be. Just in case you're wondering, I've arrived at this sawtooth by plotting out the geometry of the Ackerman steering it with uh, various turn radiuses, as you can see in this diagram here. I'm not going to explain in detail how I've done it, but you'll just have to take my word for it that it does work. So with both of the wheels pointing straight ahead, we can see the wheels are aligned with the first spikes and as we turn the wheel to the right it's aligned with the second spikes and so on. So we see that through relatively small angles the Ackerman geometry holds true but as we start to get to larger angles there's a slight disparity where the wheel isn't aligned exactly with where it should be uh, and this effect is exaggerated with even larger angles. So Ackerman geometry, based on my example, is close, probably close enough, but doesn't seem to be absolutely precise. I've modelled a second example with the steering arms pointing forwards rather than backwards to see what impact this has. And As we steer the wheels we can see that it was basically the same as the rear steering arms with a small amount of toe in at the more severe steering angles. So what are we trying to achieve in the case of the tilting vehicle? We want the Ackerman steering geometry to be maintained as closely as possible for all steering angles, for all angles of lean and when the suspension compresses. If leaning or suspension compression affects the angle of the steered wheels we will get unwanted handling effects. Any resulting toe-in or toe-out imparted to the steered wheels will cause accelerated tyre wear and extra rolling resistance. This diagram shows what's meant by toe-in and toe-out. So toe-in is where the steered wheels point inwards, uh, and when the vehicle is travelling straight ahead this is as shown here, and when the vehicle is turning the effect is as shown here. Toe-out is the opposite, so the steered wheels are angled outwards. We'll now talk about steering mechanisms. 
In cars, this problem is typically addressed by rack and pinion steering, with the steering rack and two tie rods approximating to the shape of the Ackerman linkage. The rack and pinion approach is not particularly helpful to tilting trikes, so I'm going to park that option. For a tilting vehicle, the mechanism we are most likely to use is this one, which features a bell crank attached to the handlebars or steering wheel in some way, which actuates the steered wheels via tie rods fitted with ball and socket joints. The tie rods need to have opposed threads at the ends to enable the wheel alignment to be adjusted. The bell crank can be horizontal or vertical or somewhere in between, and this is actually important as I will explain shortly. This diagram shows the bell crank in the horizontal and vertical positions. By horizontal I mean that the axis around which it rotates is horizontal, and vertical the axis around which it rotates is vertical. Since we are not using the ideal Ackerman geometry, we need to understand how to compensate for this. Tie rod length. First, let's look at the length of the tie rods relative to the tilting arms or wishbones. In my design, the upper and lower wishbones are of equal length and everything is at right angles in the upright position. In this case, the tie rod should be equal in length and parallel to the wishbones. If it's shorter, it will pull inwards as the trike leans or as the suspension compresses. This will cause the steered wheels to tow out if the steering arms are to the rear of the swivel axis or to tow in if the steering arms are in front of the swivel axis. Conversely, if the tie rods are longer than the wishbones, they will pull outwards as the trike leans, causing the opposite effect. For designs with split wishbones, the same rule applies. If the two wishbones and the tie rod are of the same length, the steering angle will not be affected by lean. If the wishbones are of unequal length but parallel, the length of the tie rod can be derived as shown in the graphic. If the wishbones are of unequal length and not parallel, the angle and length of the tie rod is derived as shown. Notwithstanding other factors to be covered in a moment, there is flexibility to move the vertical and lateral position of the tie rods without affecting the steering geometry. Steering arm angle. To achieve the ideal steering action, the steering arms should point towards the centre of the rear axle. If they point to a spot behind the rear axle, the wheels will tow in on steering, and if they point to a spot in front of the rear axle, the wheels will tow out. This holds true whether the steering arms are behind or in front of the pivots. Bell crank. The design of the bell crank is pretty important. It has three basic characteristics, the vertical distance A between the pivot and the ball joints, the horizontal distance B between the two ball joints, and the angle through which it rotates. As the bell crank rotates, the effect is to bring the outer ends of the two tie rods closer together, causing toe out for rearward steering arms and toe in for forward steering arms. This effect can be reduced by increasing distance A, reducing distance B, or reducing the angle through which the bell crank has to rotate, or a combination of the above. This is a good time to point out that positioning the bell crank with its pivot axis close to horizontal means that the ball joints do not limit the maximum angle of lean. Ball joints can have a fairly limited angle of operation, generally quite a bit less than we need for the tilting action. This constraint will affect the attachment arrangements for the outer end of the track rod too, by the way. Effect of offset of swivel point and wheel centre line. Unfortunately, the Ackerman geometry does not represent a real world situation. In order to give the steered wheels a self centering or castering action, the swivel axis is angled backwards and does not pass through the wheel centre line. The swivel axis is also likely to be angled inwards in the front view to intersect more or less at the centre of the tyre's contact patch. This means that in plan view the swivel axis is behind the wheel axis by a small amount. Or to put it another way, the wheel is moved forward slightly relative to where it would be in the Ackerman layout. This means that the steered wheels follow a slightly different path to the Ackerman geometry. By superimposing the offset wheels on the Ackerman diagram, we can see that the extension of the wheel axes no longer intersect at the centre of the turn. They intersect the rear wheel's axis slightly further out and at a different point, meaning that the turn radius is slightly larger and the wheels tow out slightly, giving a bit of tyre scrub. Although the effect of this offset is likely to be very small and potentially negligible, it may be necessary to compensate for it slightly. What is important is to note that the impact on the effective length and angle of the steering arm could be large and have a big effect on the steering geometry. The steering arm needs to be positioned relative to the pivot, not relative to the wheel axis. Effect of swivel axis inclination. As the steering axis leans backwards and inwards, 
the position of the steering arm in the horizontal plane will need to be adjusted depending on the vertical position of the steering arm in order to maintain the effective length and angle of the steering arm relative to the steering axis. If we move the position of the steering arm higher up, we also have to move it backwards and inwards, and vice versa. So what we've talked about so far allows us to draw one or two conclusions regarding the positioning of the tie rod and the steering arms. Remembering that the length of the tie rods needs to be the same length as the wishbones, if we have a rear steering arm, which points inwards, then this lends itself to the tie rod being positioned low down. Conversely, if we have a forward steering arm, where the arm points outwards, then this suggests a higher positioned tie rod. This is because, due to the angle of the steering axis, as we move the steering arm up and down, then it moves the joints inwards and outwards, and there's a sweet spot for the rear steering arm low down where the tie rod is going to be easily able to be positioned so that it's equal in length to the wishbone and the opposite is the case for the forward steering arm where a high positioned tie rod is likely to fit in most easily. Furthermore, this suggests that if we have an arrangement where the wishbones are centrally pivoted and not split, this tends to favour forward steering arms with the tie rod positioned high up in order to get the tie rod the correct length. But if we have separated wishbones, then this tends to favour rearward pointing steering arms which are positioned lower down in order for the tie rod to be the correct length. Summary so far. So let's summarise what we have covered to this point. When we are designing the steering geometry there are a number of things we can adjust to maintain the correct wheel alignment. Namely, vary the tie rod length relative to the wishbone length, vary the bell crank dimensions and vary the steering arm angle, length and vertical position. Finally, depending on whether we have single wishbones or separated wishbones, this tends to favour an upper or a lower position of the tie rod. So that's the end of the video. I hope you found this useful and I hope you've learned something. If you spotted any mistakes in what I said, please let me know in the comments below. Hopefully there aren't too many. Look out for my next video in which I'm going to show you some CAD models which demonstrate further the principles that I've discussed in this video. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell so that you don't miss it. Thank you for watching and see you next time. Now where did I put my cup of tea?